thank you very much for coming to our talk today. Um, we're going to be talking about some fun we had looking into the security of VS Code um, to kind of get things kicked off. Uh, who am I? I'm Ken Ward. I'm a principal consultant at Control Plane. Um, I love doing hacky things. Um, so primarily do a lot of offset work for Control Plane, looking at um, Kubernetes, containers, uh, CI, CD, um, but also have a background looking at government stuff in the UK, so hacking that stuff as well. Um, and when I'm not hacking for work, I'm also hacking at home, so you can tell I kind of love it. <laughs> All right. Hey, I'm Fabian. I'm also a security consultant with Control Plane. Um, yeah, I basically love to automate everything, being like watering my plants or like signing my Git commits <laughs> for everything. And then I also like um, enjoy dabbling into like um, hardware assisted security. So I spent um, almost uh, no more than a year working on a confidential computing powered Kubernetes distribution. Yeah, as discussed, what we'll go through today is um, talking about the evolution of the IDE um, and the kind of rise of VS Code. Um, after that, I'll kind of look at why adversaries will essentially care about VS Code and why they would target it. Um, we'll also demonstrate a lovely VS Code uh, malicious extension that we wrote and what it can do, um, and then provide some security advice after that. So, what IDEs has, has certainly came to prominence in the 90s. Um, at that kind of point when it, they came to prominence and getting towards the late 90s, um, essen essentially this uh, code completion started coming into the IDE and uh, syntax highlighting, debugging of like tasks and uh, as that kind of evolved back into, into the 2000s, you started to get essentially multi-language support um, and developer accessibility. So no longer was it like an exclusive club to essentially develop code. You could, um, you could use the tools that were provided within the IDE to, um, to develop the code and it gave you all the prompts and everything you needed. Um, this is also the kind of birth of lightweight editors, so the likes of um, Coda, Sublime, Notepad++ started coming into kind of fruition in, the, in this kind of period. And as we kind of transitioned out of that into the, the, the 2010s, um, we started to see that cloud-based environments started coming out. So no longer were you kind of bound to your local um, IDE. You can basically use the cloud environment to do your coding. Um, that also started to have a proliferation of uh, connections to cloud-based environments, so your AWSs, your Azures, so you could get literally real-time view of your workloads and your application workloads, um, and that came to kind of prominence as well. And kind of towards that end as well, um, security tooling started coming in, uh, but uh, giving you kind of analysis of all the libraries and packages that you're bringing in, or whether they are vulnerable. But not only that any code that you're writing or whether it had like any vulnerable functions or anything you're kind of writing on that perspective. Coming in today, um, we've seen the birth of AI within your IDE. So basically AI is now powering and trying to assist you with writing code, um, giving kind of essentially kind of syntactic uh, suggestions and even basically writing the code for you. So as we've kind of transitioned from the 90s to now where we are, a lot of that integration has kind of grown. So as that integration has kind of grown, it's just basically trying to help the developer and giving a better developer and user experience, which is the whole point of an IDE. It's supposed to be the, the one-stop place that you can kind of write code, and have a really good way of just essentially producing and pushing code. Um, unfortunately, with that functionality and flexibility, um, increases the attack surface and now with all of these services and everything available via the IDE um, you have now increased your attack surface to kind of where we used to be and you're kind of no longer uh, bound to essentially pushing code to a build server on your local network and having that basically produce the code and you deploy it locally it's now all cloud enabled so you can kind of push cloud uh, into the cloud so like github GitHub Actions can kind of build that for you, or you can send it to another kind of build server if that's what you want. And that's just naming one. 
when you start having essentially all of these external connections, it basically means I am. So whether that be a user identity or a machine identity, you have to solve it somehow of, of accessing and, and connecting all of these services together. So it's opening everything up. But why did we look at VS Code? Well, according to Google Trends, um, essentially VS Code is the most popular um, IDE, open source IDE. And these are kind of the most searched terms. So I would imagine that even when someone typed in Visual Studio, they probably meant Visual Studio Code. Um, we've also seen that other statistics, like it's around 78% of developers are using VS Code. So it's, it's a hugely adopted um, IDE now. Um, and it's not even just developers that are using it. I've seen like agilistics, ag agile people using it now, and it's just grown and grown and grown. And as that kind of popularity kind of grows, we expect to see like adversaries kind of looking at it and being very, very interested in it. Well, why we, why did we, would we worry about the IDE in, in its total? Like, why would we go after that? Why don't we just go straight for the source? Well, over the last three years, I've noticed uh, a huge change in the way that, for instance, so source code repositories handle security. Specifically, access has changed massively. In March 2023, GitHub um, made it that any user who was contributing in code into GitHub was required to have two-factor authentication, at least by one method. So it it is changed massively, and even with GitLab, their hardening guides also state that you should be applying two-factor authentication. So first of all, you've got that access control and the access uh, security is increasing. Next, the actual repository security is increasing as well. So there's a load of controls that essentially mean that when you're trying to push code to, your, to the repository, um, you have branch protection controls that mean that any PR has to kind of be, can't just be pushed straight to main. You can have, um, you have to have code owners potentially that approve that um, pull request. And uh, also administrative controls cannot be bypassed as well. So administrators have essentially settings that mean that they can't bypass those controls. So there's a lot more scrutiny put into the code that's being pushed into the repository. Um, along, alongside that as well, uh, there's been a proliferation of, of secret scanners. So I don't think you can pretty much escape any IDE or any kind of, I say IDE, but you can't escape any uh, source code repository now with any option of doing secret scanning. So secret scanning is now becoming out the box. If not, you can basically buy one that will do something that will actively look at your source code and try and find any secrets in it. So bit by bit, this, this tax surface is tightening up so how are we going to get access to it as an adversary? I'm going to go after the IDE. And for based on our experience, the IDE itself um, is relatively unmanaged. So it's an area that, that um, businesses and organizations kind of overlook as a thing. They're, co they're concentrated on packages and uh, programs that you would normally have on your desktop. But as kind of a sub-program within an IDE, they're just not that concerned. Also, your IDE sits within your laptop, and it's very kind of rare, even though I've talked about cloud-based development environments, the majority of people that we see have still got a physical environment. And that environment, the, the laptop, whatever you call your developer desktop, has usually has access to emails and all kind of other business functions as well. And those are still susceptible to kind of the usual attack vectors, phishing, drive-bys, USBs, all of these things are still able to, you're still able to use as an adversary. So what features would you essentially as an adversary be interested in? Well, VS Code has quite a number of features, but from an adversary perspective, you kind of want to be interested in the workspaces. That's where you do your work. Um, but it also means that you can save your configuration settings. It's where you can set work extensions you want to use. Um, moving on to extensions, VS Code by itself is relatively powerless. It doesn't give you quite a lot out of the box. Its power is generated by extensions. Um, so without that, you, you get a bare bones kind of IDE um, with very limited functionality. So it's, I don't know anyone who doesn't go and just go straight away and start 
installing all the extensions they need when they're doing their programming. Tasks. Um, not many people know about tasks, but tasks are essentially a means to kind of do automation through um, VS Code. So essentially, if you wanted to, let's just say you're uh, creating a Docker file and you wanted to make sure that it was building before you even made a commit into a source code repository and run it through like a GitHub action or so forth, you can literally build a task that will go off and do an automatic execution. So it's just scripted execution based on a number of, uh, based on the criteria that you define. Um, debugging. So VS Code only supports Node.js out the box for debugging. So every other debugger that you use is an extension. So anything you kind of bring in is just yet another extension. And hence why I say the extensions are set of the power of VS Code. Um, profiles are a means where you can just transport, uh, you can switch between um, the way that you use VS Code and you can basically uh, decide which extensions you want to use in specific profiles. So it's quite useful to kind of understand like how the context of which you're using it. Um, command line interface, I don't really want to go into kind of detail about that. It's pretty obvious what that does and how it works. Um, it does also support local port forwarding. Um, I'm not sure if people know about this, but if you are developing a web app um, and you wanted to test that out, you can essentially tell VS Code to open up a port to you and this auto magic Microsoft dev tunnel opens up to you to the internet and you're able to connect to it and see what it looks like. Um, we've literally just within the last five days seen Unit 42 um, uh, report that a, I would say, advanced persistent actor was using that as the initial kind of access function. So they were, um, when someone was basically running something via like an email or, or uh, the initial kind of vector, they were basically opening up this tunnel to kind of load in um, there and get access to the local device. So it is coming. Um, remote development environments, um, VS Code offers a means to kind of run uh, your environment, whether it be in a container, a full-fledged um, virtual machine, and also the Windows WSDL. So extensions, as we've kind of talked about, are hugely powerful. Um, what they can offer and, and how you can work with them is essentially these kind of things that I've just listed up here, but they're written in JavaScript and TypeScript, um, but the logic themselves can be written in any language. The, the kind of framework and structure has to be in JavaScript and TypeScript, but you can write it in Go, Python to kind of reference it and use the logic based on that if you wanted to. So they're hugely flexible. The configuration support um, is your kind of go-to toolkit for basically doing sort of notifications and configuration support for the tool. Theming, pretty obvious. You can just change the colors and so forth to however you want it customized. Language features, so based on whatever you're programming, so whether it be Python, Go, Java, you can have whatever kind of customization that might support and help you with your, with your programming. Um, Workbench is essentially a, a way to, so when VS Code comes up, you've got a panel on the kind of left-hand side. The Workbench is when you customize that, you can have custom like drop downs and, and views within that. And um, the last bit is debugging, as I kind of talked about, um, there's only no JS out of it and extensions basically enable further debugging. So let's just open up a, open up a project and see what kind of occurs. So basically I, do, I basically create a, create a folder, I open up VS Code and for that folder, and here it comes, I'm loading, and I go, yeah, sure, that looks great, brilliant, thank you very much, and we're off, and we're going to write code. But actually, what has essentially just happened there? Um, what's just happened there is Workspace Trust. Um, what we've done is Workspace Trust is, a, is a, a means to essentially restrict your workspace. And by ticking that box, we've basically said, yeah, sure, Anything that's allowed within this workspace, go to town. You can have any execution, you can run anything, anything we bring in has full-fledged privileges. Um, workspace Trust places some restrictions and it does a restriction mode. That restriction mode applies to essentially the three areas that um, VS Code team are kind of worried about and Microsoft are worried about. 
Um, that is um, your extensions we talked about, um, your tasks, and your debugger. They are things that will basically enable execution. Um, extensions themselves don't have to be fully restricted, so they're not fully disabled. It depends on how the extension has been loaded and the type of extension it is, and it's how it's trusted. Um, so, for instance, things like if you go into Workspace Trust, uh, Copilot will be disabled completely. But things like the Google, uh, the GitHub Authenticator, and I'm trying to go, I think, also just goes into a kind of a limited mode. So your extension still works, but it's limited in what it can do. Most importantly, though, in the depths of the documentation for Workspace Trust, um, it basically states that this does not stop a malicious extension, even in restricted mode. Um, so if you load something in, it will still be able to run. So their advice is vet the things that you're kind of bringing in and make sure you kind of understand what they're doing, which is not as easy as it sounds. So we've talked a little bit about um, VS Code and why someone would be interested in it and from a, an adversary perspective. Let's now think about what, what you can actually, how an attacker would go after it and the things that they could potentially go for. So for initial access, you could potentially go after um, the, the VS Code project itself um, and actually try and essentially backdoor that and attack that project. Um, I would expect a hell of a lot of controls are applied to that and the way that they will review the code. So if you're trying to push any changes and trying to do something, you'll probably have to be embedded within the VS Code team for a long period of time for you to kind of slip something in that will go unnoticed. Um, you could uh, create a malicious task that a user could um, clone. So if you clone the repo and bring it down, that task will execute. And then you're basically doing some execution based on the criteria that's met. So um, that might have limited effect, uh, effect if it's just like a, I don't know, an internal one, a, a, an internal, like a private repository. Again, with public, I would hope that the task would potentially be found before it happened. Um, you could get in via a misconfigured remote de uh, development environment. Um, it's kind of highly unlikely that that would happen, but you could imagine that someone might leave SSH open for some reason to enable you to have access to the environment to do some damage. Um, but the kind of go-to, um, as kind of indicated in the lower half, is a malicious, malicious extension. Um, extensions are the power. They enable you to basically run arbitrary code. And that uh, initial access can be done essentially via the marketplace um, or some other means as kind of indicated there. So you could potentially do a phishing attack and, and have a user try and load that in straight into your VS Code, uh, drive by compromise uh, and also remote media. So there are kind of me many methods to kind of getting an extension into your VS Code environment. And this is kind of the indication of what you might be able to do. How you get an extension into the marketplace is fairly simple. Um, so for an adversary, it's not that difficult for them to kind of even get into the marketplace itself. Um, all you need is to generate a personal access token within the uh, DevOps, Azure DevOps. The next thing is just getting an account uh, within the VS Code marketplace as the publisher. And then you use the VS Code extensions um, CLI to publish your extension. It literally is that simple. Um, so what controls then do Microsoft have to determine whether your extension is, is malicious or not? I don't often read straight off a slide, but I think this basically says it all. Um, a marketplace runs a virus scan on your extension package. Uh, that's published to ensure its safety. A virus scan is just based on a signature, so it's really easy to kind of bypass this. I'm kind of flabbergasted that like, in this age of essentially doing lots of code reviews, scanning, deep code analysis in pipelines that this is what they do. Um, added to that, 
only for official publishers, so the likes of Microsoft, and you'll see a little blue tick by it, um, will they look for typo squatting. So if you have something like an extension that's really popular as like a third party one, like community driven, themes are a very popular way of doing this. You can just easily typo squat it and they will just allow it. So forewarning. Um, installing extensions, you've got three options. Um, you have the VS Code UI, um, that is um, the normal way that people kind of access it via VS Code. They kind of look in for an extension, they look through the list. Um, in terms of determining what you want to install, there's two factors that are kind of brought up on that screen. You have number of downloads and you have essentially user ratings. That is how essentially a developer looks at something and potentially judges and has a trust associated with that extension. It's not great. <laughs> like that can easily be spoofed and, and changed by bots if you wanted to do that. Um, and you can push yours further up the list. Um, you have the .vsx, uh, .vsix files that you can uh, locally just load in uh, via the command line. And then there's also the VS Code URI handler. Now, I normally run a, a Linux distro um, for, for, for doing all my work. I tried this method like by putting like VS Code, the actual extension in and try and get it basically invoke VS Code to kind of load that extension. I tried many, many, many ways in terms of customization to make the, my desktop understand that it was like a, essentially with this URI handler, can you please invoke this thing so you can get the command line? It never worked. So as much as I believe that you can do this and maybe it's easier, I don't know, on a distribution like Microsoft, like a Windows laptop, um, I never kind of got it working. So I would say the likelihood of this kind of occurring is kind of low. Um, but significantly, if you do put this in, it will remotely go and pull the extension in. So rather than locally bringing the extension with you and dropping it on the laptop to load it, you can reference it remotely. It will invoke something like this little bar here and you can see like you um, just say yes, install please. Okay, so we've now got our execution because we've loaded our thing in. Um, it's worth noting that it's highly probable that they're not using root uh, for their VS Code instance, they're probably using a current user. But again, based on our experience, most developers have the ability to go up to root, so your sudos or run as, um, to kind of invoke administrative functions on the developer laptop. It's kind of common when you've got things like Docker and you just want to just run it. Um, so it's, it's quite a common thing, so just bear in mind that it's, that bar to entry is not too bad. Once you've kind of got execution, it really is dealer's choice. So you can either go something like um, covertly by putting like C2 in, or maybe you're looking for local kind of files and things like this to kind of enumerate, steal credentials, um, or you can kind of go more over and then just run ransomware, or you can run a crypto miner. As I said, dealer's choice at this point. Um, I've mentioned it previously and I'll mention it again. In our experience, the like a VS Code ex like extension management is just non-existent in enterprises. It's like one of these massive gaping holes, and I've I've done a lot of work with a lot of big businesses and customers, and I've never seen them managing extensions as a kind of thing. So it's like a loophole that developers can just get things in and just run and load. So it's again, it's an area that can easily be exploited. Okay, now we're getting into the privilege, privilege escalation part. Um, as I kind of mentioned, it's connecting to everything now. So you've got so many different extensions that will take credentials or, or store credentials in your local device. Everything from the GitHub Authenticator, GitLab Workflow, HashiCorp Terraform. You can read the list, it's quite significant. The way that those store those credentials and, and for primarily tokens varies based on the actual extension it, it itself. So for instance, like the AWS toolkit will take advantage of the AWS CLI to store it in the method that that normally does rather than doing its own way of storing it somewhere on the device. Um, I know that folks love the MITRE attack chain. 
So I've also built out um, this as a kind of representation of what a malicious extension would do and how it would steal credentials and then what you can essentially move on to do. Um, the biggest part or the biggest thing to note is a persistence part. Um, that's non-existent in um, and the current MITRE ATT&CK framework. I have put, well, we have put a change request forward um, to MITRE ATT&CK to basically say we believe that this should be as represented within the framework. Um, it just doesn't exist. The you know, closest you can get is like a browser extension as a kind of classification, but it's not obviously the same. Okay, examples. Um, yeah, cool. <laughs> Let's make sure. Um, okay, so there are kind of uh, a couple of reported extensions that uh, malicious extensions that have kind of been done, and this is done by Checkpoint again. Notice the thematics. So like this is theming, a lot of theming kind of extensions have kind of been done so they can typo squat, get into your environment. Um, but these have been reported by Checkpoint. Um, there have been some demonstrators as well. So um, Aqua were the first to kind of, I saw publicly state that they've run a, an example uh, malicious extension just to see whether they can affect how many people they could get. Um, the same with Emit. He also has recently done this with a Darkler official um, extension, kind of shown there. Um, you're talking tens of thousands of users uh, have got infected by uh, a simple typo squatting attack. Um, so it's there. You have been warned. <laughs> right, I'm going to hand over to Fabian, who's going to basically go through uh, the technical detail of how we've uh, created a malicious ES code extension and stealing lovely credentials. All right, thank you, Kevin. Um, yeah, as we saw, like the attack surface in VS Code is, is super big, um, but, but hopefully Microsoft has something in place to like protect the crown jewels, right? That'd be like extension secrets. Uh, don't give anything away. All right, so VS Code extensions, as we saw, obviously need to connect to different systems, right? To like a cloud account or like a Sonar Cube or whatever have you. And these are not publicly accessible, right? You need to authenticate, you need to be authorized to do anything interesting. Um, to store these, these credentials then, VS Code offers the so-called secret storage API. And this is basically doing two things for you. So it's enforcing namespaces so that different extensions can't steal their respective secrets and it also doing the uh, secret persistence for you so between vs code restarts you don't want to like re-log in every time so vs code um, yeah helps you by providing this secret storage api yeah so to store the actual token um, vs code uses one master secret to wrap all the other secrets but it's not managing that master secret itself. It's basically reaching out to Electron safe storage. So VS Code is built on Electron for the UI part, which in turn is built on <laughs> Chromium. Um, so they're just relying on their respective implementations and hang handing it through until they arrive at the actual secret storage. And this is different depending on the operating system you're running. So on Linux, it might be using libsecret in the end to store the master password or the master key in the operating system keyring. And then for persistence, on the other hand side, there is a simple SQLite um, 3 database, which stores everything from your user settings to your extension secrets, which obviously is not a problem because they are encrypted uh, with this master key. Um, yeah, so this is all fine and good, right? We could use the API, but I mean, we can also go around it. <laughs> like, there is no sandboxing or anything implemented that just keeps our extension from also talking to the OS keyring and also talking to the same database. Um, the nice thing about the OS keyring, when VS Code loads up, it asks the user to unlock the keyring so the extension has <laughs> free access to whatever is in there. So if you're interested in other stuff uh, as an extension that's inside the OS keyring, like go nuts. So, so what's actually inside this SQLite database? Um, so it's key value inside key value. And so I don't know why they chose SQL for like this, but okay. Uh, so the key part is just like an identifier. This is a secret and then some metadata, which helps with the namespacing part, right? So this secret is used for this extension and the secret is called secret token. 
And then on the value part, we just have a simple byte array, which is the, the wrapped, the encrypted token. All right, how does it work under the hood? So um, first it accesses the OS key ring value and throws that one into like a password-based key derivation function so that we basically get a key out which we can then use for our symmetric encryption. So we're using that key, right? The blue box top left is the same key that fell out out of the derivation function. And then we're using that key to encrypt the extension secret. Um, there's one interesting tidbit. So this V11 prefix indicates that the value is actually encrypted. If you see in that database a value that starts with V10, it's actually a hard-coded well-known password that is peanuts. That actually comes from the Chromium project, which is, uses this in case there is no OS keyring, it just uses that as like a static password fallback. And we actually discovered this being used in, in some configuration and instances. Um, VS Code does a good job on like informing the user that, hey, we didn't find a keyring and we would like to fall back. Is that cool with you? And then you give the thumbs up, which I think is the best thing they can do, right? Yeah. Lots of interesting choices. Okay. And then we have a quick demo on how this looks like. Um, all the tokens demoed in this, uh, shown in this demo are already revoked, so uh, don't, don't spend any time and effort. Um, so this is how it looks like if you're developing an extension in VS Code, right? You have your extension repository. It's, it's built with, with Node.js, with NPM. Um, and then if you launch it, a second VS Code instance basically opens up with ha which has this extension built and loaded for you, right? This is just the developer workflow. A real scenario like as Kevin showed, there are many different means to get this evil extension um, installed. And then instead of auto running it, uh, we, we put it behind like one of these command palette triggers, right? So there we're executing steel extension, uh, steel, steel credentials. And it basically does that, right? So it <laughs> goes into the uh, SQLite database, it goes to the keyring, finds the keyring master secret, and then can use that to decrypt all of your secrets. Um, so this is very basic protection, if, if at all. It's like any, any secret that is running has access to all the information um, yeah, to, to steal other secrets. Um, bonus question, so <laughs> what we leaked in the example before is the GitHub token that, that connects to my GitHub account, so I'm able to clone all my private repositories. And as far as I know, there's no way to just revoke a single GitHub OAuth app token. I posted the question on their, on their forums, there's no answer so far. The only thing you can do is just revoke the whole OAuth app, which invalidates all your VS Code instances that are locked in, which is super annoying. Um, and probably also deters users from actually revoking a single token because they're like too lazy to to relog into all. So yeah, may, maybe something that, that GitHub could fix at some point. <clears throat> all right, so that's the situation. What's the security advice we have for, for organizations who still want to use VS Code in, in this environment? So obviously we, we disclosed all of this information to, to Microsoft. We, we opened cases in there security response center, and they basically gave us the same quote that Kevin showed earlier, right? Only install trusted extensions. <laughs> it's like, but there are no tools to help me decide what should be a trustworthy extension, right? There's very limited metadata, there's no trust score, there's, yeah, very little help for the, for the end user in the end. Um, yeah, we also disclosed this then afterwards, and in the, in the projects uh, after we had the thumbs up from Microsoft. So we created issues in the VS Code repository to first improve their user documentation and like make this clear, like extensions are very powerful. Um, sadly, we failed to notify the downstream repositories and we acknowledged that. So we followed the MSRC process. We didn't follow the Electron security process. Sorry for that. Um, they already updated their documentation. Electron is now very clear. Um, on how secrets are stored and managed. So yeah, general security advice for enterprises who still want to use VS Code. Um, do not simply trust it, right? Use least privilege for all the developer machines. 
only give them as much access as they need to do their work. And don't give them like SSH access into production because an evil like extension could do the same thing, use the same data. And then do not implicitly trust the VS Code extension. Yes, that's the advice from Microsoft, but it's very hard to actually enforce this, right? There's no policy that would allow an administrator to limit which extensions are to be allowed or not. There's actually an open issue from someone asking for this exact feature five years ago. But right now there are no tools to help enterprises like adopt VS Code in a secure fashion. There's open VSX, which is like an alternative marketplace. So maybe that's an angle on how we could um, tackle this as an industry. All right. Yeah, and then just in general, right? This is just another example of a supply chain attack. As Kevin showed, like typo squatting attacks are like the smallest entry barrier to like put a fake extension out there that steals like PII or secrets installed on the machine. Um, there is a VS Code security roadmap. They have a lot of interesting features on there, but it's 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 a roadmap. <laughs> like there is no guarantee on when or if this these features will ever land. And then, yeah, thanks to like all the folks that Kevin already also pointed out, right? So we are building on research that others have already done. So PsyCode and Checkpoint um, already gave us a lot of like entry points and like how to look into VS Code security. They also had a similar secret stealing example, but since then VS Code changed their internal logic on how to store secrets. So we basically updated that and it's now still working again. If you want to run that extension, it's public on GitHub so you can have a play around with it. And then, yeah, Arqua and Amit, Kevin or, or already mentioned, also did some great, great research um, in, into these topics. And I think we have a few minutes for Q&A. Yeah? Who, who wants to go for, uh, yeah. Yourself? Go ahead. I have a question. Could you please go back to the Arvin um, screenshot with the Darkula official extension? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I noticed there is a, um, actually the blue check mark over there, mm -hmm. meaning that it's kind of like trusted or verified publisher. Yep. So what kind of identity checks are going on to get this verified page? Essentially the domain. So the domain. It's, it, it's, from what I understand is that if you can um, verify that you own that domain, you can get a verifier check mark in there. Doesn't necessarily mean too much. Okay. No. I think the person in the far back had his hand up. Sure. Yeah. Um, so I was curious. Uh, this this sounds like uh, like the sort of problem that that uh, any sort of smart tech might might have. So like resting on security again in the last five points from the you know, from the keyboard similar. I uh, like I I suppose I'm thinking of it like a thermal core of maybe being 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 similar in terms of the risk. Yeah, I, I, that's a lot of points. So I'm just going to re, re no, no, restate what the, the question is. Like, essentially, what you're asking is, how would we establish trust given the kind of parameters that these are kind of running in? Um, it, I, it's interesting you mentioned about Chrome. Uh, the thing to remember about Chrome is that it's sandboxed. This isn't sandboxed, so there's kind of different criteria to that uh, to start off with. But if I kind of skip back to um, I'm going back, let's go back. So my imagination and what I could think of is when you have uh, the, the icons there, I would love to see a kind of trust score next to those, um, which is kind of regularly run. Uh, yes, I agree, uh, open sourcing the actual extension itself for it to be analyzed would be a better way. Uh, maybe that's what gets dictated going forward and they can actually do some code analysis upon commit and, and changes. Um, so that's yet another thing. And 
if we could have something, I don't know, like a trust score. I know that um, Stack Lockout Trusty, and they're doing a lot of work in that kind of space to kind of indicate um, trust based on the kind of uh, Go packages, NPM, PyPy, all of those things. It's kind of do some analysis to kind of understand the kind of trust based score based on the author activity and, and the person of what they're doing. So I would love to see something like that and make it very clear when a person opens up VS Code, if the trust score has changed, you get a notification sort of saying, hey, this has changed. So you're not even doing it upon loading, it's upon running the actual, uh, your VS Code instance. That's my kind of personal thoughts of like where mm. potentially it could go. I don't know yeah. if you've got anything more. No, I, I just want to re-highlight, right, that there is no sandboxing going on, right? Compared to the Chrome extension store, if I install an extension there, it has a limited blast radius. It, it's not allowed to access files on my machine. And even if I install it, it lists like, hey, I would like to like read your web browser page and manipulate it for you. There's nothing here. Like everything you install runs as your user. Sure. I'm not too familiar with the details of Flatpak. Uh, flat the, the, this works. This works both with. I think when I've tried it with Apt and Snap. So um, I'm not saying that they're kind of the same, but I, I am unsure of whether that would help um, based on just how VS Code works under the hood and how it leverages Electron and then like the other kind of elements within it. One last one. Yes, this is a going moment with video perspectives rather than slide chain side. Did we check or do you have any indications where you could tell apart the behavior of a, a malicious extension from behavior of a developer working? So if we're going from like anomaly of like a profiler running on online. It's an excellent question. I think you would have indicators before and after rather than the actual process of accessing the secret itself. So the extension would run and do something um, and it would be accessing potentially at the entire of the key store. That might be behavior based on like it needs to access something. So maybe you configure something that it's like third party that accesses something remotely. And so it might you might trick it into thinking that it actually does need access to it. Where it would then fall down is the exfiltration of that. So at that point, you would potentially see the exfiltration going out. The worrying thing for me, and the thing that I, my evil little mind has kind of considered is that uh, GitHub is used a lot for C2 at the moment. So um, actually seeing activity, you could write an extension, detects that um, GitHub authenticator has been authenticated, take that token and then basically pass that token probably encrypted into a public repo within GitHub. And the only way that you would be able to tell is if the, by the URI, the, it's, uh, the outbound kind of call and the actual repo added on to the GitHub. I very rarely see that configured on outbound gateways so that you're literally locking down, you lock down by GitHub, not by GitHub and these repositories, these list of repositories. So it's tricky, I think, and I think you, it's so powerful that you can build cases to kind of bypass stuff. And like one of the things that I've considered is that for all the lists that I kind of listed there of, um, of things that it could access, you could essentially, given that he's all remote, you could essentially enumerate through this list, kind of go, okay, did, like what should I go and grab? And based on what I see, I go and grab it and then leverage that very thing to then send it somewhere. So, oh, I see you've got a Docker Hub credential. Well, you've obviously authenticated into Docker Hub, so I'll push the credential and build a Docker container and push that out to Docker Hub on my own one. So there's like, you by having that access, you can infer that someone has access and that's allowed out. So you can then wrap it in that thing to then push it to the thing. Um, yeah, I, <laughs> this is how my mind works. I think we're, are we close to time or we got a bit uh, more? No, we got a bit more, if anyone wants. Uh, a question and a suggestion. 
Yes. <laughs> not, 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 it's true. Yeah, yeah, but not, not even that. I'm, I'm just pointing to um, OpenVSX as an example of you, you can build your own store okay. and then enforce your own policies, right? So the, the have, a co have a corporate, have a corporate store where you only have like 100%. Yeah, or, or even we as an industry, right? We could build like a marketplace that actually enforces policies and like supports enterprises in applying policies to your local VS code as the Microsoft marketplace yeah. doesn't, doesn't do a lot. I mean, I also have a suggestion. What you could also do, what I do at home most of the time, is that I'm not running VS Code on my host, actually, but I'm using an input, previously LXC container, so yeah. it's yeah. Linux, Linux container, and I have yeah. all my development dependencies. Yeah, yeah. That, that goes that into the... the yeah. but no, it's that, a that, that's a fair point. Problem. Like, just locking up the VS Code, like, it goes into the direction of the flat pack question, right? Hmm. They, will, they will have access to my GitHub probably, but they won't have access to my emails or to... Uh, no, my all of those problems. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. exactly. Yeah, all right. It doesn't solve all the risks, but quite a few. So. Cool. Well then, thanks for attending. See you around. Thank you.